For some reason, when it comes to technology videos, YouTubers, reviewers, and even the companies that make new hardware seem to completely neglect benchmarking or testing that is relevant for any kind of person that creates music. And when they do, they'll run a test that seems relatively logical, but is kind of unrealistic, like throwing a million serum patches onto a project and just waiting for it to give out. On the flip side, if you're wanting to see benchmarks for stuff like video editing, you can find a million videos about like 4K rendering and how 4K timeline performs and insert video editing software here. There is some logic to this because generally speaking, the performance needs of video editors is a bit higher than what you might typically need with music. But it can be more helpful to look at much more music specific situations because even within the realm of music, there's so much variety to what you could be doing. And as a result, there's gonna be some variety for what you're actually looking for in a computer. So in this video, we're gonna be putting the Apple M1 to the test in a few recording, composing, and mixing scenarios. And we're gonna see where the computer might struggle, what it might be handling, well and hopefully get a better gauge for what you might be needing out of the Apple Silicon lineup. First, we're gonna take a look at tracking and recording. For this test, I'm using a song that's currently in its sketching phase. It's sort of a instrumental progressive rock song. It is a fairly lightweight project with only about 10 tracks. If you're not familiar, the general goal for what we're gonna want when it comes to tracking is low latency. And specifically, we wanna use the lowest possible buffer size we can get away with without having artifacting and other playback issues. The lower the buffer size, the less latency, but the more potential for artifacting, especially in a really heavy or dense project project. And the higher the buffer size, it'll handle a huge project much better, but you'll have more latency. It's important that you find the right balance. If not, you can frustrate the performer in certain ways and ruin what would otherwise be a great take. In my experience with recording guitar a lot and a little bit of vocals on my M1 Mac Mini, I generally record at a buffer size of 128 samples. This has pretty much little to no perceivable latency and still allows me to load up a project with a decent amount of plugins. As the project gets bigger, maybe towards about 20 tracks with different plugins on each of those, I'll definitely need to bump it up to about 256 samples, which is still pretty good. After Ozone, or whatever mastering you're using gets involved. I will see myself needing to jump up to about 512 samples and definitely maybe 1024 if it starts getting pretty freaking large. That was a lot of words. So uh, let's go ahead and play some guitar. As you can see, the playback process was just fine. You're not in the room with me, so I guess it might be harder to more authentically tell what the latency is like, but I was able to play comfortably without any latency and have some drums and certain automated effects going on. Some of this is helped by workflow, which we'll talk about a little bit later. Until a project starts getting close to about 50 tracks, or especially if there's a lot of processing going on, I'm usually able to get a comfortable and latency-free performance. Next on our list, we're gonna take a look at composition. When it comes to music composition, RAM is really the name of the game. Orchestral sample libraries, like the stuff you'll see from Spitfire Audio or East West, they will load the samples into RAM. This way they can be accessed quickly during playback. So once your project starts getting pretty large, your computer won't have difficulty playing back potentially thousands of sounds at once. Obviously the bigger your projects tend to be, the more RAM you might wanna allocate for and prepare for. This is especially important when looking at these Apple computers when as per usual, you can't really swap out the RAM. For this example, we're gonna be taking a look at a little composition I made that was sort of inspired by the Kingdom Hearts battle music after I binge played almost the entire series a couple years ago. We'll be using a buffer size of 512 samples here for playback. With this project, after everything has loaded, it looks like we've got about 6.12 gigabytes of RAM free. With that said, this is a relatively small project, but let's go ahead and take a look at how it performs. 
So it seemed to do just fine. This is one of the bigger orchestral projects that I have, and I know, especially after seeing like Junky XL's project files, that people who compose for a living, their projects can get significantly larger. I did take some time to go ahead and duplicate every single track, and for every group except for the percussion group, I selected a different set of samples to make sure that new unique samples were being loaded across all of the tracks. So now we have 72 total tracks and 117 total plugins. If we take a look at the performance now, our free RAM is right at about 4.35 gigabytes free, give or take. So about two more gigabytes of RAM ended up being used. Again, I know this doesn't cover quite the large scale projects that some of you composers may be encountering, especially once you start getting to the higher end of Spitfire Audio's libraries that'll come with their own hard drive. But I hope that this can at least help you a little bit more with gauging what you might be needing for your own projects. The last use case we're gonna be looking at is general performance while doing mixing slash production. So what I'm looking for here is tracks that are either completed and mastered or tracks that just generally use a lot more processing like uh, an EDM, for example, and see really how the CPU performs at this point because that's what really starts getting pushed with the more processing, the processor starts working harder. We'll be looking at two different projects. The first is a Tropical House song, which is one of my songs called Palmetto. I will say this project file also is maybe a bit smaller than what you might see for certain genres under the EDM umbrella. As you can tell, I'm pretty obsessed with and amazing at organizing my project files. Same as the last song, we'll be using a buffer size of 512 samples. Let's go ahead and take a listen. Because the track and plugin count is relatively small, it behaves without any real hiccups. If you watch closely on Ableton's CPU meter, which is a little bit more real time, you will see it pumping. My only guess is that this must be due to some very heavy side chaining that's going on in this track. The kick and the snare are obviously taking precedence over really the rest of the instruments. And so on each downbeat or just after each downbeat, you can see the CPU spiking as it's having to level all of these other tracks down. An asterisk that I do want to put under like the EDM umbrella, I'm sorry if you hate that generic term by the way, is that your own workflow and even the genre that you work with can make a huge difference for how the CPU behaves during your playback. I don't really write in this genre, but an example that comes to mind for me as far as like really heavy processing would be like neuro drum and bass. If the music you make is very sound design heavy, I've seen two different kinds of workflows. The first workflow would be, let's say you're using Serum, you're working on a bass preset. So obviously you call it awesome bass one and you save it and you're like, I wanna use this in this song. And what ends up happening is the sound design that you do and the actual track itself are shared in the same project. And what results is you do have several different Serum instances that could be using up processing power, especially if there's a lot of oscillators or voices. If you're using stuff like FM, those kinds of things can multiply how much one track takes up of the CPU load. The second type of workflow would be that you do all your sound design sort of in one get-go. Maybe you'll render a lot of the things that you like. So you'll be working with a certain preset and maybe you'll still save that. And you can go ahead and print those things or render them or record them depending on your DAW's workflow. And you'll go ahead and just drag them to their own folder so you can use them for later. What ends up happening then is once it comes time for you to create your track, your workflow ends up being a little bit more about the arrangement and about the track itself rather than the sound design process. This does two cool things. One is that it seems to make it so you're focused more on the song and how things feel rather than getting lost in the little details. You make sure that the big picture of the song Song remains intact. And on the technology side of things, it makes it so your CPU has a little bit more room to breathe. That is a lot of words, but do know that the kind of workflow that you use and how much you rely on software instruments or other things that use that kind of processing power, it can definitely influence how much processing power purely you might need. The last song whose performance we'll be taking a look at today is Big Blue World. This is a song of mine that's sort of a happy instrumental progressive metal sort of thing. This is easily the biggest project we'll be taking a look at coming in 
in at 52 tracks and 203 plugins. There are many instances of archetype planing all over this, as well as Neural DSP's Parallax for the bass. The drums are Get Good Drums, Modern and Massive, and those drums are routed into their own audio tracks, which are also being processed individually. With this track, we can use the same 512 sample buffer size that we've been using for the other ones. A buffer size of about 1024 samples seems to be a little bit more smooth and have a little bit less like clicking every once in a while. But let's go ahead and take a listen. So you can definitely tell that the CPU is doing a lot more heavy lifting on this one. The high performance cores are definitely getting pretty close to maxed out, and even the high efficiency cores are having to jump in as well to help them with that load. When it comes to something like metal, again, workflow is very important to consider. If you're a guitarist, this might sound like blasphemy, but uh, I don't actually own any real amps. So I do use a very software amp and just software instrument heavy workflow when I'm working on stuff like a progressive metal song. I like the flexibility. My CPU definitely takes a bigger hit as a result versus if I had some kind of a hardware unit, even like a quad cortex, or I used to have an atomic amplifier. When it's playing back, it is having to process all of those different amps at once and the drums and the compression and everything all sort of simultaneously. Also, I just want to remind you, that when the computer is getting slammed like this, it's still completely silent. What are some things we can take away from this? Number one, the higher the plugin count, and by plugins, I'm also including things like VST instruments. That's when we're gonna really start seeing a large load being put on the computer. I find that a lot of people are asking how many tracks can the processor handle? That might not necessarily be the right question. I think it's more about plugins and obviously the processing of those individual plugins that's more relevant. It's harder to count that depending on the DAW. In Ableton, I kind of just had to scroll through every single one and find out what everything had. Another takeaway, which I think I've said a few times now, if you're serious about music production in any way, whether you're doing metal or EDM or really anything that you know you're gonna be doing regularly, I really highly recommend getting 16 gigabytes of RAM. The unified memory is quite good, but if you want room to grow in any way, you might find that eight gigabytes of RAM limits you, especially in the coming years, or especially if you're like me and you tend to have like a million Chrome tabs up on a regular basis. Before I started using this Mac mini, I was using a gaming PC, which I loved. I still think that thing's cool. I generally find when it comes to the recording side of things, that I am able to use a much lower buffer size than I was able to on that machine. Much of that is certainly due to the actual M1 itself. I also think some of it might be driver related. I've found that despite some frustrations I had with Macs pre-Apple Silicon, Apple's core audio driver just seems to be a way less painful experience to deal with. I tried to cover as much as what I had my own project files of, and I do want to apologize that depending on the genre you're working with, I can't go through every single workflow and also go through, like make huge, you know, 200 plus orchestral projects for you. Depending on the size of the projects that I presented you and with you knowing what kind of projects you make, what kind of music you tend to make, I hope that looking at these real life scenarios helped you to figure out what you might be needing out of these Apple Silicon computers, see if the base model M1 is right for you, or if one of the new processors that have recently come out or may come out in the future are gonna be a much better fit for you. If you found this video helpful, please give it a like as that helps me know that I did a good job. Other than that, I have been Matt. Thank you very, very much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video. Bye. So what are what are a few so what are some useful things we can take away after looking at all these different scenarios? Number one, I feel that a lot of people will be asking about like how many tracks can your how many a lot of people I find that a lot of people are asking how many tracks. I I at least I need to I might try and make a graph to to I, I'll I find that uh, that might not necessarily be the right question.